let us continue with the suttas. Uh, and uh, the next sutta we're going to have a look at is the Anapanasati Sutta, uh, another well-known sutta in the um, uh, in the suttas. <laughs> And uh, uh, this is, if you probably, one of the main suttas that describe meditation in detail. Uh, it's very different from the previous sutta because the previous sutta focused on the experience of meditation. This one uh, focuses on what you have to do. Uh, what is kind of the, uh, actually it's a bit like what you have to do and experience together really. Uh, but uh, so this is a, a bit different, slightly different angle on meditation practice than the previous one. Uh, so they kind of go very well together. Uh, and uh, to uh, start out, as I said before, the, you know, one of the things that is o often important to look at is uh, how important is a particular sutta? Uh, how do we decide this? And again, it depends on how often it is taught. How often do you find it? And the Anapanasati Sutta is one of the suttas that is found in a number of places. Uh, the Buddha teaches mindfulness of breathing uh, a number of places uh, to a number of different people. And we can take it that the main outline of the sutta, which is the 16 steps of Anapanasati, yeah, in f divided into four uh, bits, uh, so four times four steps, uh, is what you find in here. And not only is it here, but uh, again, you also find it in the Chinese translations as well. Uh, uh, and it's uh, uh, in very much in the same way as it is, it is found here in the Anapanasati Sutta. So it is a core teaching of the Buddha. Uh, it's fairly, fairly clear here. And one of the nice things about this, we'll see this straight away as we start out, is that uh, just watching the breath uh, is a full course in meditation practice. It is all you actually have to do in meditation, is watching the breath. Uh, and there's something very marvelous about that, and wonderful about that, because uh, the breath is obviously a very natural thing. Uh, yeah? It's something that is with us all the time. Uh, there's nothing mystical about it, or strange about it. Uh, and this kind of fits in with the general idea of Buddhism being a very, it's a naturalistic religion based on natural experiences, natural phenomena. You don't have to do anything kind of very strange or weird to become uh, awakened in Buddhism. All you have to do is watch the breath. Uh, so it's very natural. Uh, and also it's very simple. Yeah, it's so easy. All you have to do is watch the breath. Uh, you don't need very much. You don't need any, <laughs> you know, any kind of fancy equipment or anything like that. You don't need to be very intelligent or smart, we can be completely dumb dumb, we can still do meditation. Isn't that good news? It's good news, isn't it? Uh, so it's not an intellectual exercise or anything like that. Uh, any ordinary person in the world is capable of reaching awakening because it's so simple. Uh, so it's a very, it's kind of a lev leveling as well, yeah? Sometimes we think of Buddhism as a very intellectual religion, and it can be. You can make it incredibly intellectual if you want to. Uh, but if you want to become enlightened, it's best not to make it too intellectual. Keep it simple, uh, because intellect tends to get away uh, of uh, uh, that simplicity which is required for just staying with the breath uh, and just being mindful. It's so simple, uh, yeah, just being mindful. Nothing really much you need to do. Uh. And this is, I think, this is a so it's such a wonderful thing uh, that is so easy, straight to the point, no messing around, all the way to awakening itself. Uh. So. Um, let us see. This is only an extract of the full sutta. It's a bit longer than this, uh, but these are the main elements that I want to focus on. Uh. So let us uh, just have start out and see what it has to say here. So it starts off with the word bhikkhus. Uh, and as I mentioned before, bhikkhus obviously means like monks. And as I mentioned earlier on here, I, when uh, a sutta starts like that with the monks, it doesn't necessarily mean that the Buddha is just talking to the monks. In fact, that is very unlikely. He's very likely to talk to all the other people who are also in the assembly. The Buddha, when he speaks to someone, uh, he always talks to the most senior people in the assembly. The monks would normally be the most senior because they were ordained first usually. Uh, but there would maybe be bhikkhunis there, uh, yeah, and there would be possibly lay people there as well, especially on the Uposatha days. Uh, on the Uposatha days, people would come to the monastery to listen to teachings. Yeah? So everybody would be often be together on the uh, Uposatha day. Yeah? So that's kind of nice. Yeah? The, the four assemblies would be there listening to the teaching. Yeah? So remember, when it says bhikkhus, uh, 
you are also included. Yeah, yeah. so you are kind of honorary bhikkhu. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of nice, isn't it? Uh, and especially when you go on retreat uh, and you uh, kind of keep the eight precepts. Yeah, uh, you know, on a on a longer retreat. Uh, are all of you in white? Are you keeping the eight precepts while you're here? Or uh, yeah, okay, good. Uh, yeah, so that's that's nice, isn't it? Uh, and then you are almost like a monastic. Yeah, that's the reality of it. You're almost there because the eight precepts are very close. Uh, and while you're here, you're not going to be spending much money, presumably, either. So you're almost keeping the tenth precept. Uh, so you're very, very close to the life of a monastic. Uh, it's like uh, the life of a samanera is the ten precepts. And the di difference between a samanera or samaneri and a bhikkhu and a bhikkhuni is actually not that great. Uh, the reason why the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis have so many rules is just because the, it's like the ten precepts subdivided into many small rules, basically. Uh, yeah? The difference isn't that great. There's a bit more restraint, uh, but the difference isn't that enormous. The ten precepts are the basis of the spiritual life. Uh, when you keep that, you are already uh, an honorary bhikkhu. E even the eight, you are already an honorary bhikkhu and bhikkhuni at that particular point. So bhikkhu is definitely includes people who keep the eight precepts. Uh. So when mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, uh, it is a great fruit and great benefit. Uh. When mindfulness of breathing is developed and cultivated, it fulfills the four applications of mindfulness. Uh, when the four applications of mindfulness are developed and cultivated, uh, they fulfill the seven factors of awakening. Uh, when the seven factors of awakening are developed and cultivated, uh, they fulfill vijja, insight, uh, and f liberation. Vimutti, deliverance, it says here, like liberation. So, uh, s developed and cultivated, uh, uh, I haven't got the Pali in front of me now, but I think it's Bahulikata, uh, Bhavet, something like that, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yes, okay, <laughs> thanks. It doesn't matter. Uh, what, what it means is that you know, when you keep on doing this and you develop it and develop it, take it deeper and deeper and deeper, it means you have to put in quite a bit of effort. That's really what it means. Uh, not so much effort, but you have to do the practice yeah, again and again over a long period of time. That is when you get these kind of results. Uh, you have to persevere. You have to commit. Uh, that's really what it says. You have to commit to watching the breath. Uh, the breath is al always there, so it's just a matter of being aware of it. Uh, then you have great fruit and great, great benefit, just like so many things in life. If you want to be an expert in something, you have to put in the time. So what is that great fruit and benefit? And the first part here, which is very interesting already, it says that merely by doing the mindfulness of breathing, you are fulfilling the four applications of mindfulness. Uh, you fulfill them. That's all you have to do is watch the breath uh, and you actually fulfill the four satipatthanas as a consequence. Uh, and this is uh, important because when you read the uh, Satipatthana Sutta, what you will see is that the Satipatthana Sutta is divided into four parts. Yeah? This is the Sutta on the applications of mindfulness or here called the foundations of mindfulness. It's four parts. It is the contemplation of the body, Kaya Nupasana is the first part. Contemplation of feeling, Vedana Nupasana is the second part. Contemplation of the mind, Chitta Nupasana is the third part. And contemplation of principles or contemplation of mental phenomena, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Dhamma Nupasana is the fourth part. So it's divided into four parts. And in that sutta, mindfulness of breathing is only mentioned within the first part, the body contemplation. Uh, that's the only place that is mentioned. Uh, and because of that, when many, in many systems of meditation, uh, all they do, they do mindfulness of breathing for a while, uh, and then they leave it aside, and they start doing Vedana Nupasana, doing the other parts. Uh, because most many people consider a breath meditation only to belong to the contemplation of the body. Huh? But that is, um, uh, is misleading and uh, it is interesting, you know, why even, why, why do we even find the breath meditation there in the Satipatthana Sutta in this way? Why it is there when it says here that it, contemp that it completes, fulfills everything? Uh, how come in the Satipatthana Sutta it is fi found in only the first of the four? Yeah, here it says it completes everything, there is found only in the first. Uh, so what is going on? What is this discrepancy that we see here? Uh, 
And uh, this is uh, where you have to actually study something as the suttas in a fair bit of detail. And there are people who have done that who are far more scholarly than I am, who people who know all the various languages uh, th you know, that we find the early suttas in Tibetan, ancient uh, or middle Chinese or whatever it's called. Uh, and uh, you know uh, Sanskrit and Pali and Tibetan and uh, you know a dozen other languages, uh, and uh, and when they when you do comparison of these various versions of the suttas, uh, then uh, what you find is that uh, Anapanasati probably doesn't belong inside the Satipatthana Sutta at all, uh, and originally the Satipatthana Sutta may have emphasized only the contemplation of the thirty-one parts of the body. Uh, that may have been the original contemplation in the Kaya Nupassana. And the meditation on the breath doesn't actually belong there. Why not? Because it fulfills everything. It belongs to all the four parts uh, of Satipatthana. So this is where sometimes you need to study these things in, in quite a bit of detail to be able to understand how this really fits together. So uh, this is, a very, I think, a very important point, that Anapanasati is all you need to do, uh, and that actually fulfills everything here. Yeah. So does that mean that <coughs> just because it is all you need to do, does it mean that you shouldn't do anything else? Not necessarily. You can still do body contemplation, like the 31 parts or the four elements and these kind of things. Uh, you can still do those, uh, but what it means is that it is not absolutely required. Uh, and if you are having success with the breath, actually the breath is enough. Uh, and that's quite nice, isn't it? Uh, all you have to do is watch the breath. Uh, very simple, very easy instructions. Uh, uh, and uh, so if you find that that works for you and you enjoy watching the breath uh, and you're having some success with that, uh, please continue. And there's nothing else you have to do in the whole world pretty much. Uh, except for eating every now and again and that sort of thing, you know? <laughs> so, uh, very handy. Uh, so this is the first thing to kind of that is important with this particular sutta, and uh, which makes it quite interesting. Yeah. And uh, it, it is particularly interesting because sometimes uh, the Satipatthana is not always easy to understand exactly what you're supposed to do. Uh, the Veda Anupasana, all it does, it lists a large number of feelings and says you're supposed to know the feelings, uh, but it doesn't give any context for that. It doesn't tell you how should you meditate, what should you be doing. Uh, so it's very open for interpretation. And uh, o many different uh, meditation traditions interpret these things in different ways. Uh, and everyone says, my way is right. Yeah. So I always ask, well, what did the Buddha say? Well, the Buddha says, do Anapanasati, and that's enough. Uh, so um, uh, then we have, when the four foundation or applications of mindfulness are developed and cultivated, they fulfill the seven factors of awakening. Uh, seven factors of awakening are really about samadhi, and as I said before, the seven factors of awakening are very similar to the sutta we were just looking at before, called dependent liberation, yeah, because it goes through, the, the, the factors are have piti, they have pasadi, these are the joy, this is the tranquility, samadhi is in there, and then you have at the last upeka, which is kind of the highest uh, level of samadhi, but it also has energy in there, Virya, it has Dhammavichya, investigation of Dhammas and mindfulness. And so it, mindfulness starts off with Satipatthana, yeah, that's mindfulness, uh, and it takes you all the way up to the highest kind of Samadhi, Upeka, which is like the fourth jhana. This is what the Sambhujangas are all about, the factors of awakening. So, um, in other words, what this means is that if you practice mindfulness of breathing properly, it takes you to samadhi, it takes you to the jhanas, it, all of these things are included. All the way up to the fourth jhana is part of this mindfulness of breathing, if you do it in the right way. Yeah, yeah via the satipatthanas, then to the sambhojangas, all the way to the fourth jhana. Just this humble breath, yeah, can take you all the way so far. Your breath is your friend. Yeah, if it can take you to the jhanas, must be your friend. If it can take you to that much bliss and stillness and peace, well, can't get a better friend than that. Uh. And that's a very beautiful way of thinking about the breath. Uh. When you think about your breath as your friend, a good friend who you are traveling on this path with, uh, yeah, I didn't give, give much instructions during the last meditation because it just didn't feel like it, so I just didn't do it. Uh. I apologize, but that's the way sometimes it goes. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, so, you know, 
That's one of those beautiful perceptions to give rise to while you're meditating. Think of your breath, breath as your friend, uh, this beautiful friend that you're going along with on this wonderful journey into meditation practice uh, with whom you can experience so much happiness, so much bliss, so much peace. Uh, the best friend in the world, uh, nothing gets better than that. Uh, and if you see your breath in that way, the breath starts to become very beautiful. Uh, and then when the breath becomes beautiful, everything happens Yeah, as a consequence. Uh, so um, this is the breath, taking you all the way to the bhujangas and all that. Uh, and then the bhujangas, because the bhujangas include the deepest states of samadhi, they then lead also to liberation, vidya and uh, vimutti. Vidya being the insights, we talked about those briefly before, uh, uh, which includes awakening itself, uh, it includes the recollection of the past lives and uh, kamma, understanding kamma and all of that. Uh, and liberation, of course, liberation from uh, the oppressions of the world, liberation from suffering, liberation from defilements, uh, and liberations from the rebirth, and all of that is included in the idea of liberation. Vijjavimutti is the end of the path. Uh, that is what we're all kind of aiming for ultimately here. Uh, and it is freedom, freedom from jail, freedom from being tied down, bound down to suffering, forced to suffer from life to life, uh, by the forces of the mind which we're trying to overcome. Huh? So that is the, um, uh, just the context for the Anapanasati. That's the promise. It's a pretty good promise for this simple thing, just breathing consciously, being aware of the breath. That's all we have to do. And all of that is what happens. Uh. And of course, a big part of meditation practice is to find out why it doesn't happen. Yeah. Because we, even though it's pretty obvious, we know what mindfulness is, we know what the breath is, uh, still it doesn't happen straight away. Why not? Well, that is a very big part of what meditation practice is about, uh, to find out the obstacles. So, uh, then the Buddha says, and how bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, uh, upasakas, upasikas, uh, is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated so that it is of great fruit and great benefit? Uh, yeah, so this is the discussion for how it is of great fruit and great benefit. So if you, uh, if you uh, don't follow these steps, then it is likely it will not be of great fruit and great benefit. If you want it to be, uh, if you want it to be of great fruit and great benefit, this is what you have to do. Huh? Here, a bhikkhu, a bhikkhuni, a upasaka, an upasaka, gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut sits down, uh, having folded their legs crosswise, uh, set their body erect and establish uh, mindfulness in front of them. Uh, ever mindful, they breathe in. Mindful, they breathe out. So here you have the background, yeah, the, the basic instruction. And this is the instruction that comes before you really start the mindfulness of breathing. Uh, and um, very often the instruction that comes before, uh, which you have to, the things that you have to get right before you start, uh, that is often the most important part. Uh, because uh, mindfulness of breathing is largely an automatic process like we saw before, uh, yeah? It happens more or less by itself once we get everything right. Uh, what we do before is actually the most important thing. Yeah? So the first thing you will notice here, it says that you have gone to the forest uh, or to the root of a tree, or to an empty hut. Yeah, Aranya Gata, it's actually to the wilderness really. Uh, Rukamula Gata, Rukamula, the root of a tree, or the foot of a tree. Uh, uh, Sunyagara, and Sunyagara is an empty hut, or empty house, or empty place. And uh, so what you feeling you get straight away here, these are places of seclusion. Yeah? This is why these are mentioned in this way. Uh, these are secluded places. Uh, and uh, this is kind of the, the critical issue here. Uh. So what this means really is that uh, for the full benefit of the mindfulness of breathing, uh, for meditation to take you all the way to awakening, uh, ideally you should be in a secluded place. Uh. And this is one reason why when you do a meditation retreat, uh, very often you will withdraw from ordinary society uh, and you go to a particular retreat place. This is why monks and nuns who practice seriously meditation, 
that live in the forest. That's why you have forest d- forest-dwelling monastics. And if you look around the world, almost everywhere in the world, those monastics who are the most respected by, by, by anyone, really, uh, are those who live in the forest, precisely for these kind of reasons, because that is where you do the practice of Buddhism to its highest potential. Uh, it, that doesn't mean that it's impossible to do it well in other sit- situations, but this is the ideal conditions, and this is what we really should do. So if you are serious about uh, practicing Anapanasati uh, yourself, uh, then uh, sometimes it's good uh, to go to places where you can at least be partly secluded. Yeah? And uh, uh, a good meditation center is often a place where you, it's like a halfway house between the ordinary uh, worldly existence uh, and the monastic existence. Uh, you become almost a bit like a monastic for a while. This is not bad too, yeah, if you stay here, because if you stay here for a few days, uh, you come out of your ordinary environment, your ordinary house, your ordinary things that you do. This place reminds you probably more of Dhamma than uh, your house, yeah. The house is o- doesn't have the same kind of feeling of Dhamma as a Buddhist center. This is already quite good. Uh, already takes you out of your ordinary environment, uh, a little bit away from the, your habits, uh, and that makes it easier already to practice meditation properly and the path properly. Even better than this is like Jana Grove. Yeah, many of you have been to Perth. Yes, I definitely. Uh, so you've been to, you have some idea what Jana Grove meditation center is like. Yeah, some of you have stayed there for a long time, uh, and uh, that is. Even better, because actually it's in the forest. Uh, yeah, this is more like the concrete jungle, but that is the real jungle, not jungle, but the real forest down there. Uh, and you can feel that the forest nature. You can feel almost uh, that it is a conducive environment for meditation practice, because the mind tends to calm down almost naturally when you have nature around you. Uh. So this is why uh, this shows you something about the importance of. Uh, forest dwelling, yeah, wilderness dwellings in Buddhism. And one of the things that always struck me in the suttas, well, as many things, one of the things that struck me is uh, also something found in the uh, Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the very beginning of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. The Buddha has just spoken to uh, uh, Ajata Sattu, the king, and uh, he has told the king about, you know, how to how the Vajians, the um, people to the north of the river Ganges, the king Ajatasattu is the uh, king of the Magadan kingdom south of the river, he just, just told him how to uh, fight the, the, the Vajians, or why the Vajians are hard to defeat, because they have these seven factors that make them stronger. And then he says to the monks, what are the seven factors uh, that will uh, keep the Dhamma strong in the future? Uh, yeah? The seven factors that will lead to growth rather than decline in the Dhamma. It's very interesting. The Buddha is about to pass away. He teaches all the Buddhists how they should live in the future to ensure the Dhamma keeps on being propagated from generation to generation, from culture to culture. Yeah. And one of the things in there which is kind of astonishing is that one of the things that will make sure that the Dhamma is strong in the future is that the monastics enjoy forest dwellings. Yeah. This is one of the factors for actually making Buddhism survive. You think there were other things like teaching the Dhamma properly or whatever, but th- that's not even in there. Huh? But living in the forest is. Uh, that's how important it is. Yeah? And the reason why it is so important is because uh, when you live in the forest, that is where meditation fully happens. Uh, so that is where you have the insights. Uh, that is where you understand what Buddhism is about. And it's only when you understand what Buddhism is about personally uh, that you can really propagate it into the future f- to the next generation. Uh, once it is purely theoretical, just coming from a book, uh, it will never have the same power as when it comes from personal experience. Uh. And this is why sometimes you feel that there are certain people, uh, the way they teach, you get this feeling that it, this is from personal experience. Yeah? There are some people who have this kind of energy about them, or they have this uh, Dhamma confidence about them. Or some, this was always what impressed me with Ajahn Brahm. I thought, this, he knows what he's talking about. Uh, I remember reading some of his discourses back in the early 90s when I was starting out. I thought, wow, here is someone I really, this feels right. Uh, and uh, so I went all the way to Australia from Europe because I knew this was who I wanted as my teacher. And I was right. I've been there ever since. Yeah, so I got, got that right. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so it really matters, uh, and this is what is so fascinating about this. And this is one of the reasons why monastic life is uh, 
uh, of preferable yeah, to the lay life, why it is more conducive to the full practice of the Buddhist path. Uh, it doesn't mean you cannot practice as a lay person, of course you can. Uh, I'm just saying why it is yeah, it probably a little bit better to be a monastic because it's more easy to get access to these kind of situations where you can practice fully. Uh, so mindfulness breathing happens in the forest. It's a secluded thing. You have to withdraw from the sensual world. You have to withdraw from the noise and the hustle and bustle of ordinary life to allow your mind to calm down, to allow the mind to kind of dry out from sensual pleasures. The city is the realm of sensuality. The forest is the exact opposite. The forest is where these things can uh, be let go of. When you are in the forest, you may enjoy the forest, you may kind of uh, feel it's nice to be there with the animals and the kangaroos or whatever, but it doesn't have that, uh, at you don't attach to it in the same way as you attach to the sensual things of the world uh, that you find in the city or you find in uh, other situations. So, so uh, that is the first part to uh, you know understand about uh, mindfulness of breathing. It's a secluded practice. Uh, and then you sit down. This is the next one it has here. Huh? So it is a sitting practice. Uh, it is not something that you can easily do while doing walking meditation. If you're going to do walking meditation, I would recommend you to do something else rather than watching the breath. There are some uh, schools of meditation where they say you can watch the breath while walking. But uh, again, I, you know, I, I think it sitting down is mo much more appropriate for watching the breath, especially when the breath starts to calm down and become incredibly subtle. Uh, I don't know how you're going to be able to watch it while you're walking. It seems impossible uh, because it is just too coarse. It's difficult enough to follow it when you're sitting down and being completely still, let alone if you're walking. Uh, so, uh, and also the fact that you're moving tends to make the breath more coarse. It's more difficult to calm it down in this way. So I think that everything really points to sitting for uh, mindfulness of breathing here. You can perhaps also lie down, although the Buddha here says we should sit. Uh, if your mindfulness is stronger, you may have success in lying down. So you can try that, uh, especially if your body has many pains in it or is very sore or you are hurting or whatever. You can try to lie down on your back and see if that works. Uh, it is kind of very, when you lie down, you're really at ease. Yeah, that's the nice thing about lying down. You can really relax fully. Uh, so try different postures a little bit. Uh, yeah, but uh, I don't think walking is ideal. Uh, and standing, I don't think standing is not really a meditation posture. Uh, I think, uh, I know some people who try it, but uh, anyway, it's up to you. Try what, uh, you can try whatever you want and see what happens. But uh, sitting is the main posture. And again, sitting means, really, it uh, means um, whatever is comfortable as far as I'm concerned. Uh, uh, here it says having fold, folded your legs crosswise, uh, uh, but uh, the way I understand that is that this was the way that was comfortable for people in ancient India to sit down. They would often sit on the floor, this was natural for them, uh, it was easy, uh, and that's why they, they did this. And there is some evidence in the suttas and vinya to suggest that that is actually true. Uh, that's how they were comfortable. Uh, but uh, I know many people who have had success with uh, meditation in other postures. Uh, I know one monk, he, uh, he, was stand he was doing meditation while he was standing on his head. <laughs> and uh, that's not recommended because if you really, ha if you have success, and he was, he was standing on his head and he got this nimitta coming up, yeah, and you start losing control of your body because your body is disappearing. Yeah? And before he knew it, he was kind of in a big pile on the floor, yeah, because he just collapsed from standing on your head. So I wouldn't recommend that posture, so don't do that. Uh, but apart from standing on the head, the other postures can be, can be useful. Uh. So, um, uh, having folded your cross leg crosswise, if you can sit cross-legged, uh, you can try uh, that posture because uh, it is, uh, uh, if you get used to it and it's comfortable for you, it c it's quite nice and steady uh, and sturdy. Uh, uh, and it feels good, but uh, it's by no means necessary here. Yeah. And very quickly, if you have success in um, your meditation, the body starts to disappear anyway. Yeah. It doesn't really matter so much anymore. The posture, yeah, kind of everything just disappears, and it's uh, uh, it's kind of becomes very irrelevant very quickly here. Yeah. So uh, then you set your body erect. 
and it means str having a straight back, basically. Ujju kayang, something like that. Uh, I think ujju kayang is straight body. And uh, the idea here is that when your body is kind of straight or you have a good posture, you tend to have a bit more mindfulness. Yeah, this is the idea. But again, it's important to get things in the right order. Uh, uh, don't kind of sit too straight too quickly if you feel that your mind is all over the place or you are tired or whatever. Because if you try to force a wakefulness uh, when you, you're not ready for it, uh, it's going to have a negative effect on you. Uh. And some of the best meditators I know, they are really, they really relax in the beginning of the meditation. Yeah? As Abraham says, you know, he's been working hard, he's tired, he leans back against the wall. Uh, no straightness at all, just lean back, yeah? lean back. Yeah? Wait for the mindfulness to come back. Uh, wait for the body and the mind to relax. Uh, and then, when everything calms down uh, and the energy returns, uh, and if you have lived your life well, the energy does come back quite quickly because it is there, just under the surface. It's just the tiredness is kind of clouding the, uh, the good energy, uh, and you just relax. The good energy comes up again, uh, and then uh, you find that your body almost wants to sit straight. Uh, it wants to sit straight because when you have energy, it's kind of natural. Uh, yeah, you don't need to relax anymore. Uh. So uh, uh, do these things in the, uh, uh, in the right order. Know what you have to do. Uh. Another one of monks I know, he always nods at the beginning of his meditation. Uh. It's good to know, yeah. Always nods at the beginning of his meditation. So, and then he nods, yeah, 15 minutes or whatever. Bang, he kind of b b gets clarity and then he meditates and then he's very, very clear and has very good meditation afterwards. Uh. So all of these things are okay. Uh. There's nothing wrong with nodding a bit at the beginning, nothing wrong with dozing off a little bit. Uh. Yeah, yeah, and it's just the nature of the mind that it gets tired uh, and sometimes you need to just uh, relax the mind, allow it to do what is natural to it. We tend to force things too much, force our minds too much, and that is the actually more of a problem. Uh, but allowing things to be, uh, yeah, just everything is okay, there's nothing wrong with being in a certain way. No need to judge yourself, accept yourself for who you are, uh, and the more you accept yourself for who you are, the easier the meditation process becomes. So, uh, and then uh, we have uh, the last part here, the last bit of uh, advice before you actually start the mindfulness of breathing. And this is what I was uh, referring to before, having established uh, yeah, mindfulness in front of you. Satting parimukkang upata petva. And uh, so this Again, this is what I mean by having, yeah, so you have already done it. Uh, having folded the legs cross, but having set the body erect, having established mindfulness in front of him. Uh, and so this has to be done before you can even start watching the breath. Uh, this is a prior thing, uh, uh, and this is why it is so important to take all that time uh, where all you do is just relax, you allow things to be, uh, you allow your mind to be in its natural state, uh, and then mindfulness gradually comes back, and it comes back into place again. Uh. So how do we establish mindfulness? And of course, uh, again, uh, there is uh, uh, two ways of looking at this. And one, uh, one way is just the what you have to do in the here and now while you're here, sitting on your every day in your meditation, uh, and then very often, what you can do now is only so much. Uh, and that is basically just relaxing, allowing the mind to be, and allowing the mindfulness to, uh, to come pretty much by itself. Uh. So it is very much a natural process. Don't do too much. Uh. What you can do, uh, and that is what I would call just kind of nudging the mind a little bit. Uh. Don't do very much, but a little bit of nudging is okay. Very gentle reminder to yourself to kind of guide your mind in the right direction. Uh. And that little bit of nudging is often just a kind of perceiving things in a good way, uh, uh, reminding yourself of something positive, something that makes you feel more at ease, more relaxed. Uh, yeah, where the Buddha talks about the Buddha Nusattis and all of these things, the recollection of the Buddha, whatever. These little things that kind of make you enjoy the moment more. Uh, yeah, enjoy the company here, enjoy the place, uh, enjoy the moment, think of something uh, positive in your spiritual life in the past that lifted you up. Uh, little things like that, a very gentle nudging of the mind. Uh, or if you feel defilements coming up in the mind, then you gently nudge the mind in the right direction so that the upset and the anger doesn't really take hold. If it takes hold, uh, it's very hard to get rid of it again afterwards. Uh. So you forgive a little bit, or you look at the 
positive side of the other person, yeah, very gently, uh, if that happens, uh, and then uh, you can overcome those problems very quickly. And sometimes we need to do that because sometimes when you sit down, there's so much stuff that is still uh, there that you know that that c comes up. It's strange when you become peaceful. Sometimes all these memories come up that you that you've forgotten, a <laughs> forgotten even had some of these memories, and they kind of come back to you because of uh, the peace of the mind. The mind becomes much more powerful, and memories are more easy to access as a consequence. So allow the mindfulness to come, but remember that in the long run, uh, what makes you a mindful person in the long run is that you live your general life well. Uh, and this is the two things that I mentioned already, um, uh, is the two things that um, are supportive of mindfulness of Satipatthana are sila on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand the Ujrakaditi, the straight view. Uh, these are the two things. Uh, yeah, so again, ask yourself if you can do something Keep on, keep that sila going. Uh, the longer you keep it going, the more you do it, the more years you practice it, the more fully it is embedded in you, the more it is part of your character, who you are as a person, the more powerful and beneficial it is going to be in the meditation practice. Uh, so you want to really purify that to the maximum. Uh, yeah, all those things that I already mentioned before, you have to take into account the mental sila, uh, obviously the verbal and the uh, actions, but also the mental sila and the positive actions and all of that has to be part of it. Uh. And then the Ujrukaditi, straightening out your view. Uh, yeah, the more clarity you have about prioritizing the meditation, uh, the more clarity you have about what really is important in life, uh, the more clarity you have about how the world tends to let you down, the more clarity you have about the urgency of this whole thing. Uh, all of these things will be beneficial uh, for giving rise to mindfulness. Uh, so that is what we mean by establishing mindfulness. It's a long-term thing and it's a short-term thing that happens now. Both of those have to fall into place. Uh, so please don't start uh, watching the breath uh, until you have established that mindfulness. Uh, once it is established, that is the right time to kind of uh, get going with the breath meditation. And you will have to learn yourself a little bit what enough mindfulness means. Uh, yeah, There's not something that you can actually uh, kind of explain so much, uh, because th there are so many degrees of mindfulness, so many degrees of clarity, but what it means really is that you are not that your mind is not super busy, uh, running all over the place, it's reasonably peaceful. There are probably still some thoughts going through the mind, but not many. And you have a degree of clarity. Uh, you're not very tired or falling asleep or anything like that. Uh, so you have a degree of clarity and not too much thinking. Uh, that is when mindfulness starts to get established. You have a feeling of presence in this room. You have a feeling that you, uh, you, know, you, are, you are here and you're not kind of all over the place. Uh, and then for the rest of it, you have to kind of sort of fill out for yourself what is the right time. And then mindfulness of breathing starts. And uh, this is what happens. One of the actually things that is said about mindfulness of breathing in the suttas elsewhere is that it is said to be the thing that calms down the thinking mind. Yeah, so it means it cannot be that you are completely without thinking before you start, uh, because the purpose of uh, mindfulness of breathing is actually to calm you down. Uh, but there isn't much thinking left, uh, and then the last of the thinking is then calmed down by anapanasati. Uh. So, what happens then? Uh, then it says here, ever mindful, uh, you breathe in. Mindful, you breathe out. Uh, Ever mindful? Uh, um, I would say only mindful. You breathe in, only mindful, you breathe out. Uh, and um, this is a translation issue, so now I can get into how to translate Pali. And this little word ever, uh, in English, it is a translation of the word eva in Pali. It's got no relation to ever at all, even though it sounds a little bit similar. But eva, E-V-A in Pali, ever in English. Uh, and the problem with this little word eva in Pali, it can mean different things depending on the context. It can be an intensifier, it means like ever, always, uh, or it can mean, mean something like only or just. Uh. So what does it mean here? Does it mean ever? Is it an intensifier or is it more like just, only, only mindful? Uh. And uh, 
I think the answer is ever does not make much sense here. You are still starting out with mindfulness of breathing. Uh, at the very beginning, your mindfulness is still not super strong. Uh, you're not still seeing the full breath. Ever mindful gives you the idea that you're always mindful, completely stable. Yeah, that's what it gives. Uh, it's an intensification of mindfulness. Uh, but actually, in this context, that doesn't make any sense. Whereas only mindful makes sense because uh, the point here is that the meditation practice is done purely by, by way of mindfulness. Mindfulness is the only thing that you actually use. And uh, the way I understand that fits in with the other suttas. There's no need for willpower. There's no need for intention. There's no need to uh, will the breath or to use, uh, use will to uh, stay with the object. Mindfulness is all you need. Yeah? Having established mindfulness means the mindfulness is already there. Now you don't need any willpower. Now the time is just to sit back and allow the mind, or or allow the breath uh, to develop itself. It's a small little point, but somehow it makes, it makes quite a bit of difference when you think about it. Uh, yeah? Ever only. A small little thing, but uh, actually it, it matters. Uh, so only mindful. Nothing more to do than be aware. That's all you have to do. Uh, no need to uh, to, to uh, force anything or to uh, you know place your mind on the object or whatever. Uh, only mindful, you breathe in. Uh, only mindful, you breathe out. Uh, and then, uh, what happens is the following: uh, breathing in long, you understand. I breathe in long. Uh, or breathing out long, you understand. I breathe out long. Uh, breathing in short. Uh, you understand, I breathe in short. Or breathing out short, you understand, I breathe out short. Let's just stop there. Yeah. So, uh, you understand, yeah? Uh, you, you don't do anything. I've already, the, the word only means there's not, no doing here, there's no force required, there's only awareness. So when it says breathing in long, you understand, it is not that you make the breath long. This is a very uh, common misunderstanding of, I think, the Anapanasati Sutta, that you make the breath long. And then because you make it long, then it becomes long, and then you breathe accordingly. But that is not really the point. The point is just that uh, the breath tends to be long when you start out. If you are mindful, you are relaxed, you are at ease, the breath tends to be quite long and relaxed and easy. Yeah, so you are understand, you know the breath as it is. This is the point here, uh, is knowing the breath, is not controlling it. Uh, and uh, it is quite common for people to think they need to control the breath, uh, but I think if you do that, uh, you tend to destroy the whole exercise. Uh, everything becomes contrived, becomes forced, uh, becomes unpleasant very quickly, uh, and then uh, it doesn't really work how it's supposed to be. Uh. So you have to be patient here. You have to just allow things to be. Stand back. You understand. Pajanati is the Pali. You know the breath is long. You breathe in, you breathe out. And as you develop this, as, the, as you keep on practicing with the, the long breath, as you calm down, the breath tends to become shorter. Yeah, this is quite a common experience. It doesn't matter if that's not what happens to you, but it's quite a common experience that the breath becomes shorter after a while. Yeah, so it's long because you relax, but because you are becoming even more peaceful after a while, the breath tends to shorten as you as you move on. Uh, so this is this may be what is meant here, or it just means that whatever length the breath is, you are aware if it's short or you are aware of it's long. It just means you have awareness of the breath. Really, that's what it means. Uh. And then, once you understand that, and the next one says, you train thus, I shall breathe in, experiencing the whole body of the breath. You train thus, I shall breathe out, experiencing the whole body of the breath. And uh, uh, what is happening here is that uh, now you have uh, experiencing the whole body of the breath, so this means now that previously you had only maybe uh, you didn't experience the breath fully, now your attention expands out to take in the whole breath. Uh, yeah, everything from the very beginning to the very end. Uh, the whole breath is included in this. Uh, 
So it means you're becoming more peaceful, you're becoming more alert, uh, your mindfulness is improving and that's why you're able to see more of what is going on. Uh. Before, maybe you only had enough mindfulness to notice whether the breath was long or short. Uh. Now you have the ability to see more of the breath. Uh. Yeah, This is why the whole body of the breath, uh, the breath is co here called a body in this particular context. Uh. Now I should perhaps point out, one thing I didn't point out is uh, uh, this idea of uh, parimukha, of mindfulness. Where is uh, your mindfulness in this particular context? Uh, this is one of those very controversial topics, yeah, or uh, maybe not very controversial, but a little bit controversial. And people will argue about this in scholarly papers. It's here. No, it's there. No, it's not this way. It's that way. Or whatever, whatever it is that they do. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, uh, the way I find the way Ajahn Brahm talks about it very useful. Uh, and he just says, Parimukha, the breath, you don't need to locate it anywhere in particular. It is breath meditation, not body meditation. So all you have to do is know whether the breath is long or short. You don't actually need to fixate it anywhere on the body. And if you think about it, breathing in, breathing out, uh, yeah, you, you, you know very easily whether you're breathing in, whether you're breathing out. But but it doesn't have to have any relationship to the body anywhere. It's just a, an awareness, uh, yeah? So you just know that. Uh, and uh, the advantage of that is that uh, when you start your breath meditation, uh, if you focus too narrowly, uh, it can become too tense very quickly. Uh, so instead of focusing narrowly in one particular point of the body, uh, you have a more broader awareness, breathing in, uh, breathing out. Uh, that's, that's all you really need to do. Uh, and. Uh, uh, this is the way Ajahn Brahm has always taught, and he is uh, kind of uh, his, he he has had lots of success with breath meditation. So if it works for him, then uh, I think uh, it uh, it may very well be what is intended right here. But again, it doesn't matter how you do it. Uh, again, if you find that you want to do the breath meditation by focusing on a particular place, please do so. If it works for you, do whatever works for you. Uh, don't be too kind of tied down to any particular technique. Uh, this is not about being dogmatic. If you don't do it this way, no chance of getting Nibbana. It's not, it's not quite like that. Yeah? There are different ways of doing the same thing. Yeah? So that is the parimokkang. So uh, just uh, go with the flow. That's what I think is the best way. And then you expand your awareness so you see the whole body of the breath. Uh, one of the things you will may perhaps have noticed here is that in the Pali, in this text it says, first of all you understand, but now it says you train. So what, is th what does that mean? Well, how come there is a difference in verb there? Uh, now in the in other versions of the sutta there is no difference in verb, but there is in the Pali. So what is going on? And uh, uh, I think the answer is that uh, when you start out, uh, you're already mindful. You already have the ability to be aware of the breath. So all you need to do is understand. But to be able to see the whole breath uh, takes a while. It takes a bit of training. That's what it's called here. But training doesn't mean that you have to do anything through willpower. You have to force anything into existence. It just means it takes a bit of time. Uh, you have to allow things to calm down. That's the training here. Uh. Yeah, so you allow things to calm down, to become peaceful. Uh, and that is the training. And then you see more. Uh. It just means it doesn't happen automatically, immediately, just because you have mindfulness. Uh. And then we have this uh, controversial thing here. You may have noticed that it says, of the breath, in parentheses. Uh. That's a bit of a worry, isn't it? It says in parentheses. Uh. So what does that mean? It's in parentheses. Does it mean that... Uh, why is it in parentheses? Did the Buddha say it or did he not say it? We want to know. We don't want to be left in the dark like that. And uh, the reason it is in parentheses is because that is actually an addition from the commentary. The sutta just says you breathe in, experiencing the whole body. And it's kind of leaving it open, what that means. Yeah, and so this is another controversial point. Uh, does it mean that you actually sabbakaya patisang vedi? Does it mean you experience the whole physical body? Or do, what does it mean? Uh, and uh, there are different opinions about this. Uh, and uh, I have argued with other people over these little points before, so I know exactly <laughs> what this is like. And uh, sometimes people have very strong opinions and you can't really convince them, so it's okay. People are allowed to have different opinions about this. Uh, and as long as you are making progress in your meditation, it doesn't probably doesn't matter so much. Uh, if you become peaceful and you come back to the breath and things go in the right direction, it's not so important. Uh, but having said that, uh, um, 
I think personally the, the evidence points to it being a reference to the breath. First of all, because we are doing breath meditation, it is just another step in the breath meditation, yeah. So and the breath is becoming more and more peaceful. It doesn't seem suddenly out of the sixteen steps, one step should certainly have nothing to do with the breath, whereas everything else does. It doesn't seem uh, meaningful to me. Yeah? Uh, and the other thing is that later on in the sutta, the breath is called a body. Yeah, it's called one body among the bodies. It's specifically called a body. Huh? So if the s breath is called a body in the sutta, it seems to me this is very likely to be what it means here. In fact, in the very next step, uh, we come just straight come to straight now, uh, the breath is called kaya sankara, the bodily movement or the bodily activity. Huh? Yeah, so again, related to the body, the activity of the body, or the active part of the body, or something like that. Uh. So uh, this is so I would say you you are if you are watching the breath then you are certainly can't really get this wrong yeah and then you calm down the breath you see more and more of the breath uh, I think that is a, a very natural interpretation of this uh, if you prefer alternative interpretations that's okay as well huh? so then we come to the last of these four steps uh, the last one is. Uh, he trains thus, uh, I shall breathe in, tranquilizing the bodily formation. Uh, he trains thus, I shall breathe out, tranquilizing the bodily formation. Uh, and um, <laughs> it's pretty meaningless, isn't it? Uh, tranquilizing the bodily formation, it doesn't mean very much. And this is one of the things about translation, is that uh, translations, in my opinion, should be meaningful. Uh, they shouldn't be correct in a sort of technical sense. Uh, they should be meaningful because these are real instructions for very important spiritual practice and unless they are meaningful they stop you from actually getting somewhere. So here it would be much better to translate as something like I breathe in uh, tranquilizing the bodily activity. Uh, then you will have much more understanding for what is going on here. And Sankara can very easily mean activity uh, because uh, it means uh, that's what it means very often in the suttas. Uh, it is the ac ac active part of the mind, the intention, yeah, the things that we do. Sankara, from the word karoti, which quite literally means to act or to do. Uh, so doing together, putting together activity. Uh, and uh, that, as I mentioned before, it is defined as the breath actually elsewhere in the sutta. So kaya sankara means the breath. Uh, and it is defined as the breath in places like the fourth jhana, where the breath disappears completely and stops once and for all. Uh, and uh, w of course you don't die, but the breath just disappears. Uh, so here you're training, you're tranquilizing the bodily formation. And again, the training doesn't mean that you are actively tranquilizing it. Uh, it just means that you are aware. And as you are aware, because you're not, uh, you're not uh, doing anything, you're not uh, um, interrupting the sequence or the practice, uh, because of that uh, the tranquilization is automatic. Uh, it just happens. Uh, you're becoming peaceful all by yourself, just by being aware, just by being here. Tranquility happens. It tranquilizes down, becoming more and more peaceful, sometimes until the breath almost disappear, disappears completely. Uh, yeah, People say, where's my breath? Uh, I, um, and people get afraid. They think they're going to die or something because the breath is disappearing. Uh, but uh, usually the body knows how to look after itself, so you don't have to worry so much. You're able to sleep for many hours and you're still uh, alive when you come out of the sleep. So usually you're okay, you don't have to worry too much. So if you don't see your breath, uh, relax. Yeah, No need to worry too much. Uh. But this is what can happen already at this kind of stage, uh, when the breath becomes very, very subtle uh, and your mindfulness is not quite able to keep up with the subtlety of the breath. Uh. And it's interesting because already at this point, uh, even if you can do just this much, already it is quite delightful. Uh, yeah, it's already quite nice. Uh, you don't have to do all of the steps of this meditation, uh, but already now you are tend to be in a much more peaceful state uh, than you are in ordinary everyday life when you are running around and thinking about things and doing stuff and uh, whatever it is. Uh, so already it's getting nice and you're only on step four. Uh, there's another 12 steps to go. Uh, so if step number four is good or step number three is good, uh, imagine how good is it when you get to the step 16. Uh, this is like kind of the, uh, uh, this, is, this is only the beginning here. Uh. And uh, this part that we have uh, seen now, uh, 
This is equivalent to the kaya nupassana of satipatthana. So when you have done these four steps, you have fulfilled the kaya nupassana, the contemplation of the body in the uh, satipatthana sutta. This is all you have to do, and this is how you uh, complete the uh, kaya nupassana. So, uh, and this is actually said later on in the sutta, although I have not included it here. I've left, left all that part of it out. Uh, so there you are. That is the uh, body contemplation uh, and the beginning of the Anapanasati Sutta. And um, uh, I will stop there because that is uh, an hour has uh, uh, disappeared already. Uh, disappears very fast. Uh, and uh, so please keep on enjoying yourself uh, and uh, have a nice evening. Uh, and for those of you who uh, 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 going home, then uh, come back. We'll see you again tomorrow morning. Uh, and for the rest of you, please enjoy your meditation practice. Uh, okay, maybe, yeah, let's maybe do a quick, let, let's bow down to the Buddha, everyone. That's a nice thing to do. Uh, and then we can kind of uh, leave afterwards. Uh. <coughs>